and welcome to the KU Summer Community Webinar Series. I'm joined by Dr. Ali Khaivi from the Department of Immunology and Physiology, College of Health Sciences and Medicine. Now, we're going to be talking about the coronavirus because, of course, we are. And the coronavirus has had a huge global impact. But I wonder if you could start by telling us a bit more about the timeline of the disease. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, you know, we're going to focus today on the uh, economic consequences of the coronavirus. Uh, but it's a good idea first to uh, go through a timeline and see when uh, the disease appeared and so we can relate that, that to the economic changes mm. that occurred. Uh, in December 31st, the last day of 2019, uh, there were some media reports and statements from the city of Wuhan, uh, which is in the Hubei province in central China. Uh, and they were reporting uh, cases of viral pneumonia. Uh, and in January 9, 2020, uh, the World Health Organization reported that the Chinese authorities determined that this outbreak uh, was caused by a novel coronavirus and they named it Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, Coronavirus 2. Uh, in January 30th, 2020, uh, the World Health Organization uh, declared that COVID-19 uh, outbreak is a public health emergency now uh, of international concern. And this is really the highest level of alarm uh, that is declared by the WHO. Uh, and finally, in March 11, 2020, uh, you know, the hood characterized COVID-19 as a global pandemic because now it, start, it started to appear in uh, many countries. Uh, and, uh, n you know, that's the only, uh, you know, information I'll give you about COVID, but now we will switch to some of the economic consequences mm -hmm. that uh, occurred as a result of that. There are many indicators of an impact on an economy. And I suppose the one to start with would be the stock markets. What's the connection between the stock markets around the world and the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, uh, as you know, uh, the stock market is a good indicator of usually what happens in the economy. Uh, and I probably will focus a little bit more on the Dow, uh, Jones Industrial Average, which is, uh, uh, you know, or what they call the Dow 30, you know, because uh, the listing is for 30, uh, large, uh, you know, U.S. companies, mm -hmm. but in reality, these companies are, uh, you know, international because you will, so, such as McDonald, uh, Microsoft, Apple. Uh, these 30 companies are listed on the Dow, and they cover practically uh, the overwhelming majority of the sectors mm -hmm. that are represented in the U.S. economy. Uh, so, therefore, what happens to these companies since they cover? so many sectors from industrial sector to consumer products to financials uh, to you know airplanes such as boeing uh, so therefore banks you know so whatever happens to them or financial services uh, you know companies such as american express and visa so really what happens uh, to the dow 30 really usually is a good reflection of what's happening in the economy and that's why I think it's a good idea to kind of uh, talk a little bit about that and see what happens uh, in the uh, you know, stock market as a result of this uh, global pandemic. As a matter of fact, uh, in, uh, you know, there are eight, eight out of 10 uh, of the largest one day losses in the history of the stock market occurred in March and February of 2020. Wow after this, uh, you know, uh, pandemic was declared global. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, in March 16th, uh, the stock market went down by almost 3,000 points, which was uh, about 13% of the value of uh, the Dow 30. So it was uh, unbelievable. Uh, and just a few days before that, uh, on March 12th, it went down by about 10 percent too. Wow. So you can imagine uh, the impact on these companies as well as, uh, you know, uh, other uh, industries. 
And of course, you can imagine uh, some uh, you know, industries get hurt more than others, such as the, you know, uh, the hospitality industry, because people stopped going to uh, restaurants. You know, they were so afraid of the yeah. infection. Aeroplanes, practically all airlines, uh, you know, practically came to a halt. Uh, and of course, sporting events, nobody was going to go and to any crowded place, movie theaters. I mean, you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, the effect on uh, all these industries. Uh, however, uh, I must say that by the end of the year, even though March was really brutal when it came to the uh, stock market and especially the Dow 30, uh, by the end of the year, the stock market was up by 7.25%. And I think probably the reason for that is uh, if we probably all remember that in December 11th of 2020, uh, the Food and Drug Administration uh, issued an emergency uh, use authorization for the first uh, you know, vaccine for COVID-19, which was made by Pfizer and BioNTech. And one week after that, they gave another uh, authorization for emergency use uh, for uh, the vaccine that was made by Moderna. Mm. So probably, uh, you know, as a result of that, because we started to have at least some control over the disease, the stock market came back and in fact it was up 7.25% uh, by the end of the year. So that's what happened to the stock market. Could we say then that the pharmaceutical industry kind of benefited from this? Well, yes, you could, you know, because the uh, government really gave them a lot of money to develop the vaccines. But you have to keep in mind because a lot of the employees were sent home. Yeah. So they were not probably as productive as they would have been under different circumstances. But all in all, they probably benefited. And you can imagine too, you know, with the, some of the compute, some of the uh, technology companies yeah. benefited because, you know, everybody was switching to online learning and online working online. Uh, so people, you know, institutions as well as companies where they had to upgrade very quickly to catch up. Uh, so that's what, yeah, some companies probably benefited, uh, but uh, probably the majority did not. You mentioned employees and we'll touch on employment rates in a moment. But just before that, let's discuss oil prices. That's another good indicator of an economy, especially in this region. Yes, of course. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, when all, you know, when the industry practically comes to a halt, mm. especially, you know, uh, planes practically were grounded. Uh, so you, uh, you know, the oil prices under normal circumstances, they get affected by supply and demand. So now the demand is practically dropping precipitously, you know, so the oil prices, uh, in fact, uh, for the first time in history, uh, in April 2020, uh, the, the price became negative. You know, you might, in fact, it was 37, negative $37 for the barrel, you know. So you might ask, what does that mean? That means in order for you to give a person a barrel of oil, you had to pay them money. So you were paying people to take the oil off your take hands? Take the oil. <laughs> and the reason for that is because, you know, oil, when it's produced, it has to be stored before yeah. it gets to its final destination. So therefore, you were paying these people to store the oil for you. Right. Uh, and uh, again, that's probably the first time that happens in history. Of course, oil prices can be also affected by other than supply and demand, they can be affected by international events, uh, maybe even disruption to the uh, shipping channels. Yeah. You remember last March that incident where a ship got stuck in the Suez Canal. Yeah. So that kind of uh, the oil prices went up a little bit because people were afraid that, you know, as a result of that, they're not going to be able to get the oil. Well, now, uh, luckily for us in this area, uh, the amount of money that you need to produce uh, the oil, you know, to get it out of the ground is somewhat low. Mm. So even when the prices go down a little bit, you can still uh, produce the oil. Uh, in some countries such as, uh, you know, uh, Britain and Norway, uh, the, uh, it's, uh, it costs, uh, you know, almost 
close to $50 to get the barrel of oil out of, out of the ground. So you can imagine if the price goes below that, they're not going to be yeah. too much interested in producing it. But here in our area, practically in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, uh, you know, in order to get the oil out of the ground, it costs around $10. Mm. So even when the price goes down, you can still, uh, you know, maintain the industry going. I suppose the other problem is you can't just put the lid back on the oil well once you've drilled it, so you've got to keep producing. Uh, yes, you know, because it's if you stop producing and then you have to restart again, there is an expense to that. So it... And what effect did all these things have on a country's gross domestic product, especially in the US? Uh, well, again, uh, remember the gross domestic uh, product uh, or gross you know, domestic product is usually a good indicator mm. also of the economy. Uh, because really that's the value of uh, products and services that are produced in a country. Uh, and uh, in the year 2020, uh, the GDP in the US went down by about $500 billion. So, uh, you know, in 2019, it was $21.43 billion, a trillion, sorry, I'm saying trillion dollars, that's the GDP of the US, and it went down by $500 billion. So, uh, you know, that's uh, usually that doesn't happen, you know, the GDP increases uh, from year to year. And, and of course, if you look at the global GDP, uh, it also reflected uh, the same story. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, uh, this uh, in the year 2020, uh, the GDP, the global GDP was $84.5 trillion while in 2019 it was 87.3 trillion dollars so it went down by about 2.8 trillion dollars yeah that is uh, the good news is the uh, estimation uh, or the uh, you know predictions mm. for 2021 uh, is going to be a little bit there will be a little bit of an increase in both uh, the gdp of the us as well as the global gdp and again, we very often talk about the GDP of the U.S. because we do have a lot of data on that. Uh, usually it's produced by the Labor Department in the U.S. And uh, the GDP of the U.S. is about one quarter of the global GDP. So it usually gives you a good indication of what's happening even globally. If those projections are accurate, the ones you just mentioned, when can we expect the economy to recover from this pandemic? Well, most, uh, most economists say that we are starting to recover already. That's good. Uh, yeah, because I remember, uh, you know, even though there was a significant uh, drop in the GDP, mm -hmm. but the expectations in uh, March and April were a lot more severe. You know, again, because remember at that time, we still did not have any idea about the development of a vaccine. Is it going to be... This is 2020, so, March. 2020, yeah. yes. So, uh, but however, by the second half of the year, we started to get some data mm. that shows that some of these vaccines were safe and effective. So really, the economy started to recover back then. Because, you know, if you look at each particular quarter in 2020, the second quarter, we saw an unbelievable dip in GDP in the U.S. was more than 25%. However, it came back and increased by about that much in the third quarter. And I think that was a reflection of the fact that uh, we were getting some clues about uh, the development of vaccines. Uh, and, you know, so that helped a little bit. So I really believe uh, whether we're going to recover economically to the full extent or go back to, uh, you know, uh, the time before COVID, it really depends on how effective we are in controlling the virus and its transmission. That then depends a lot on the people behind everything going on. We mentioned a little bit about employment rates and as people are returning to work now, they've been vaccinated. Uh, have employment, did they drop quite significantly employment rates? Are they recovering now? What's going on there? Well, yes, the, uh, now in the US, and of course, uh, in uh, between uh, the middle of March and the end of April 2020, 
So when we started knowing about the global pandemic, uh, about 20.6 million jobs were lost. You know, this is like 45 days, so that's a huge drop. In fact, the unemployment rate became 14.7 percent. Yes, even though uh, in February it was only 3.5 percent, which was the lowest almost in 50 years. Uh, and globally, only as a result of the lockdown and by the estimation of the International uh, Labour Organization, which is an agency of the United Nations, uh, there was a loss of 114 million jobs simply as the result of the lockdown and 225 million people lost their jobs globally uh, and that was a, a loss of income just from you know labor income of about 3.7 trillion dollars so it was uh, somewhat severe however by the end of the year uh, you know for the year 2020 uh, the u.s economy really ended up losing only 9.37 million jobs which is a lot less than 20.6 million. And again, probably the reason for that is the fact that by the end of the year, we started to get a little bit more control over the transmission of the disease. And, you know, many governments were instituted, instituting procedures to uh, help people protect themselves and really enforcing many of them. But again, the, uh, probably the most important factor really was the vaccine. Uh, because, you know, at one point, if more people are vaccinated, you can get to uh, the herd immunity that people hear about, which usually we get to uh, when we get to about 70 percent to 80 percent uh, of the people. If they get vaccinated, we will get to that level and that probably will help with controlling the virus and I believe it will help uh, also, uh, you know, uh, restoring the economy to what it was before. So you feel hopeful then for the future? Yes, for sure. Uh, I think, uh, uh, like I said, uh, the number of vaccines that were developed uh, really within a period of one year, usually it takes uh, more than five years, sometimes more than 10 years to develop a vaccine. Uh, so this happened in uh, you know, a record time and uh, thankfully that helped all of us uh, you know, to uh, kind of get a little control over the virus even though we're not in total control yet mm -hmm. and I think people should still continue to get vaccinated and wear a mask and social distance and wash their hands. You know, the, uh, these are uh, easy things to do but you can protect yourself as well as protect others and uh, restore the economy ultimately, which uh, we all need. Yeah. Tell us about the human cost. Well, you know, we're talking about the economy and of course that's important, but uh, it's nothing compared to the, uh, you know, human cost of COVID-19. Uh, as of uh, July, uh, you know, uh, 14, 2021, 4.05 million people have lost their lives, uh, you know, worldwide. Here in United Arab Emirates, we lost uh, 1,876 people so far. Uh, and the total number of cases worldwide, again, as of July 14th, uh, 2021, is about 188 million. And, uh, you know, so you can imagine, uh, you know, the death uh, that, uh, you know, of course, even one death is, uh, a lot, but imagine more than 4 million people. And of course, there are people that re recovered from the disease, but yet they might face uh, consequences later on, long-term effects. Uh, and of course, we all remember, uh, you know, you couldn't even uh, visit uh, your grandparents because uh, everybody was afraid, you know, that you might give them the disease and they're vulnerable, you know, so they needed more protection. So again, the, the human cost was uh, definitely incalculable and I think we all probably have heard stories that uh, ultimately, uh, you know, just very sad, you know. So hopefully uh, the sooner we can, uh, you know, control the transmission of the disease, uh, the better we will all be, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, the cost that humans have uh, paid for this disease. Dr. Ali, thank you so much for joining us and participating in this webinar.
Well, thank you very much. It was my pleasure.